Good morning, Bitcoiners. Hello and welcome back to another edition of your Bitcoin economic calendar, the news and analysis you need to start the week off right in Bitcoin. I'm Mauricio Di Bartolomeo, co-founder of Ledin, and we have a great episode for you this week. As always, in today's issue, we're going to start by talking about the Bitcoin friendly U.S. banks who are scheduled to report Q4 earnings this week. And the interesting thing there will be to see what their results were and what they share in terms of guidance. Second, we're going to talk about the stablecoin supply of USDC, which flipped the stablecoin supply of Tether, of the, the largest and most popular stablecoin for many years, um, on the Ethereum blockchain. So we're going to discuss um, some insights and some takeaways from this event. And last but certainly not least, we're going to touch on the GBTC, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, whose uh, discount to net asset value reached its lowest point ever last week. We're going to break down why that might be and what investors might be anticipating. So grab your coffees, everyone. It's going to be a great one today. And starting as we usually do with Bitcoin, we see here that Bitcoin's price action last week was mixed. It found support later in the week, as we see here, the closing uh, level of this candle was right in line with the closing level of the January 3rd candle. Um, however, it did make a new low uh, on Monday of last week, uh, and it continues to be under pressure. We see that it's given up a quite a bit of the gains that we had from last week already, uh, two days into this week. Now, while we are not scheduled to hear anything from the Fed or inflation data this week, there are several indicators in the market that point towards potential volatility ahead for Bitcoin. Um, and we're going to go through those right now. For one, uh, spot trading volumes, which we can see here, uh, remain relatively low, um, much lower in fact than where we, where we were last time we were at these trading levels. So if you can see here, um, the trading levels last time we were around uh, the 41, 42K mark were much more elevated than the ones we are seeing today, especially if we consider the ones we saw back in May, uh, even when we were coming back around uh, you know, this time around when this was in uh, mid to late July, we see again that the volumes around the same price ranges were much higher back earlier in the year or earlier in last year. Um, this is uh, this just means that the depth, uh, the liquidity depth in the markets is not necessarily as uh, deep as it used to be uh, earlier in the year. The um, second indicator that here that we wanted to show was the fact that open interest in the Bitcoin futures markets remain very elevated. And this is the uh, graph that we're showing here now uh, on your screen. You'll see that uh, in here it shows essentially the open interest across uh, several exchanges. But the interesting thing to note here is that if we can see the total volume is still at 11 billion dollars of open interest. Um, which is pretty elevated if we consider that back in June, we were trading at around 6 billion, 6.3 billion. Uh, and even if we go back to late July, again, when we were in similar price ranges, um, we see that the total was at 8 billion, still well, well below the current 11.4, 11.6 billion, which is, again, a significant amount of open interest in the futures markets. And as we've covered here before, Bitcoin futures are primarily used by many investors to access leverage and a high level of open interest in the futures could cause volatility if the prices move suddenly. Um, and this happens because many investors that are using extreme leverage can get liquidated during small price moves or relatively small price moves. And what this does is it creates th these liquidation sales create further selling pressure. And this is defined uh, or referred to often as a long squeeze, which means it's essentially like a skating effect down. Um, this could actually also happen on the other way around if people are using uh, futures to take on leverage to the opposite side. So let's just say that in the, in the case that these were open interest futures of people being short Bitcoin, um, when the price starts moving up, they would also uh, get liquidated and this would create uh, an acceleration of the rally. And this is often referred to as a short squeeze. So in any direction, whether up or down, the presence of leverage can accelerate the moves in either direction. Um, now, to get a sense of where leverage investors are positioning themselves, uh, whether it's long or short, an insightful thing that we can look at is the short interest for Bitcoin in the Bitfinex exchange. And we can do this by selecting the BTC to USD shorts 
uh, on TradingView, and um, this, you know, we can see this this chart here. Now, to to paint the better picture, let's overlay this on top of the Bitcoin price chart, and let's do that in the uh, daily format. And this just shows us here, um, basically halfway into December, into where we are now, and we're going to overlay this with the BTC USDC shorts. So as you can see here, um, the, what we're trying to highlight here is that there has been um, there's been a there's been a build up of uh, short positions. Right, around, it started right around January fourth, and uh, and has continued to build up throughout the week. Uh, we can see here that it has continued to ramp higher uh, from the sixteenth. So you know, since the weekend, it's been, it's basically been climbing uh, since all the way last week. Um, and um, and as you can see here from this chart as well, we see that the, the Bitfinex shorts actually tend to surge uh, before uh, the December 4th uh, big drop, for instance. And we're seeing that the Bitcoin uh, short interest in Bitfinex is actually reaching similar levels uh, than where they were before that big drop on December 4th. Now, looking uh, elsewhere in the markets, we can see that um, if we look at the futures curve for Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin futures contracts, we're going to pop that up right here. Um, this is the curve for uh, futures contracts for Bitcoin as of this morning. And we can see that this curve has, in fact, uh, been flattening since last week. It has become less steep, less steep. And the other interesting thing is that most venues as of this morning are pricing Bitcoin for July delivery. So Bitcoin at the end of July below forty five thousand um, dollars. This is uh, you know, as of last night or as of the weekend, they were all pricing Bitcoin lower than 50K. This morning, we see that all venues are pricing Bitcoin below 45K. Um, come uh, end of July, actually below 43,250. The highest price is uh, at 43,200. So that is another interesting uh, insight. And last but certainly not least, we wanted to check out the options flow for the current day in Bitcoin. Um, and we wanted to share that this same options flow number um, over the weekend was showing uh, a high number of put buying and a high number of call selling. And we'll get into um, what those could mean right uh, right after uh, we just highlight this. So in here, we see that there is a um, higher amount of put buys than put sells. And there is rather an equal amount of call buys than call sells. So this has evened out a little bit since yesterday. But yesterday, um, this same options flow for Monday, which is a pretty... Um, uh, telling day in terms of positioning, we were seeing put buys in the order of 23% um, versus put sells at 21%. And we were seeing call sells at 30% versus call buys of 19%. So based on the, on the options flow that we saw yesterday, when uh, people or when investors are buying more puts than they are selling, they are buying downside protection. And when investors are selling more calls than they are buying, well, they are selling upside participation. So both of these uh, buying of puts and selling of calls uh, in a higher relations than, than the opposite ends of the trade can be for, can be seen as defensive uh, positions in this in the portfolio. So trying to get protection from the portfolio. Um, and this behavior is consistent with some of what we just saw in the futures market and the short interest that we just saw on Bitfinex. Now, not all of the indicators are gloomy, however. And if we look at the on-chain behavior of Bitcoin hodlers, we see some very interesting data. Uh, and the data that you have here is courtesy of uh, Glassnode. And this measures the net change in the position of Bitcoin hodlers. Um, and this is all taken from on-chain data. When the indicator is green, it means that coins are maturing at a faster rate than they are being spent. So they are being bought and they are being held. And the days after the coin last transacted are growing. When the indicator is red, it indicates high levels of spending. Coins are being traded or spent faster than they are being accumulated. So as we can see, uh, the recent behavior suggests that hodlers are accumulating at these levels. Um, this is this blue box here that, that you see with the highlights. Um, now, 
Switching gears for a second and looking at other external potential catalysts for Bitcoin, um, we see that the SEC, uh, and this is a, an older article, but this one is the one that essentially speaks to the SEC delaying the decision on GBTC uh, until February 6th. Uh, and that is when the Grayscale uh, or when the SEC is going to issue a decision on whether the application to turn the GBTC into an ETF will be approved or not. Now, looking at the uh, discount level for the GBTC, uh, which sometimes can act as a proxy of investor excitement or uh, their, their uh, expression as to what the chances are of this becoming uh, an ETF, as this gets closer to zero, the discount gets closer to zero, it would mean that investors seem that uh, believe that it, the fund is much closer to turning into an ETF because an ETF should not have a net asset value discount to the price of the unit. Um, what we can see, in fact, is that the opposite happened. Uh, the GBTC discount to net asset value reached its lowest point ever last week. It's, uh, it traded at a discount of 23.16% relative to the value of the Bitcoins that the fund holds. So what this suggests is that investors may not be too optimistic about potentially getting an approval to turn into an ETF um, in the next two weeks. So more on this in our What's Ahead section later today. Moving over to our analysis of the S&P 500, we see that the S&P had a pretty volatile week last week, but managed to finish the week essentially flat down eight basis points. Uh, and this came after Wednesday's 7% inflation reading in the U.S. provided really no surprises. It was bang on with uh, analyst expectations. We do see that the S&P is down hard this morning, um, almost at the lows of last week's session. Um, and that might be, have something to do with the fact that Treasury yields are absolutely soaring this morning. Um, more on this briefly. But um, to speak about um, this event and, and what we've been seeing since the inflation reading came out, uh, we wanted to share this article from um, uh, Mean Offend, which is a UK newspaper, which essentially talks about what happened, which is the global stocks continued to rise last week after the inflation reading. Investors essentially just shrugged, shrugged off the inflation data out of the US. And this... Uh, this is uh, very interesting because, as we mentioned um, last week, the yield on the 10-year note has continued to soar. Uh, it was already north of the 1.75 level that we highlighted last week, and it's up again this morning, uh, surpassing 1.84%. And as of yesterday, it looked like the S&P was unbothered by the rising of these Treasury yields. However, the clues were in the were, were in the VIX. Um, we were basically reading or, or writing this as of as of last night, and we were highlighting that even though the S and P seemed to be unbothered, we had seen a massive spike in the in the VIX index. So the VIX index tracks the volatility of the S and P five hundred options contracts, and. It rose essentially by more than 8% last week. It rose up to 31% relative to um, essentially January 10th in the, in the spike intra week last week. And it's already up considerably this morning. So the VIX essentially was sniffing out that investors were looking for downside protection as early as yesterday uh, ahead of this big drop that we're seeing today at uh, one. Uh, 1.4 uh, in excess of 1.4 percent drop in the S&P 500. Um, so this means, I mean, it meant this yesterday, and it continues to mean this today that investors are likely buying downside protection and increasingly willing to pay a premium for that protection. Now, despite the spike in volatility and the rising yields, um, there are many investors uh, who remain bullish on U.S. equities as we head into fourth quarter 2021 earnings season. Earnings season for US companies uh, kicked off last week and goes into high gear this week. And that is, um, we have this article for uh, essentially making reference to that. Um, according to Credit Suisse chief US equities strategist, Jonathan Golub, the market is pricing a 20% year-over-year growth in earnings. 
and he thinks that companies will likely beat that. Um, he also added that this time around, everyone is expected to do better than tech, which is interesting because as we've mentioned, there's been a rotation away from tech stocks into value stocks as yields are poised to go higher. These, these growth stocks have to discount their future earnings at a higher rate and they suffer more because more of their earnings are happening in the future in terms of projections. Um, in terms of earnings this week, we get to hear from Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Netflix, Procter & Gamble, Silvergate and & Signature. Um, we're going to break those down in our What's Ahead section along with some insights and details on those reports. Um, staying on the topic of, of uh, bullish macro investors, uh, macro investors like Dan Tapiro highlight that when real interest rates have been negative in the past, asset returns have been historic. Uh, and this is the tweet that he's making reference to or that we're making reference to now. And in here, it shows a couple of things. Um, one, it notes that when interest rates have been negative, they have remained negative for a multi-year period. And the, the real yield on the 10-year note in the U.S. went into negative territory in mid-2019, meaning we could have a few years of negative real rates left. Time and earnings will tell. Um, it'll be a quiet week for the Fed as officials are on a quiet period ahead of their two-day FOMC meeting, which happens next week, January 25th. And as a parting note, we wanted to highlight the correlation between the S&P 500 and Bitcoin prices. Now, while, uh, let's pop that up here uh, before we get into the commentary. Here she is. So let's just look at the one month correlation for a second. And this is the one month correlation here. Now, while the one year correlation, uh, price correlation between Bitcoin and the S&P 500 has been historically low, um, we can see here, if we just pop up the, the one year correlation, we see that it has historically trended even close to zero, uh, it has gone as, as high as 40, but essentially it has traded, uh, historically has moved, ranged between this 10 and 20% mark. This is the one year correlation. If we look at the one month correlation, it is currently trading at um, a 56% correlation with the one month price moves of the S&P 500. Um, this is a very good reason to stay tuned for Bitcoiners to stay tuned to US earnings reports and Fed updates in the weeks and months ahead, just given that the correlation has increased as of recently. Moving over to gold, we see that the U.S. dollar index took a beating last week. It finished down 60 basis points, um, and this helped gold uh, finish its week higher uh, by 1.20%. Um, now, while the yield on the 10-year note <laughs> rose by 17% last week, it is still sitting at a mere 1.85% as of this morning. And that is far, far away from December's 7% inflation, which means that the real rates of the 10-year bonds are well into negative territory. On, in this environment, gold has continued to benefit from rising U.S. inflation as it has thrown the real returns of these bonds further into the negative. Um, and it, gold could continue to benefit as long as real rates remain negative. As real rates become more positive, this puts pressure on gold as people look to essentially get into some of the safety of that dollar with, uh, with real returns on treasury bonds. Now, with, the gold, uh, with gold's price action being so impacted and driven largely by Fed activity, um, we, you know, gold could remain uh, trading range bound in price until the Fed meeting next week provides more insights as to where we could be heading. Moving over to our DeFi analysis, we see that the DeFi index seemed to found some footing last week, but it has since given the gains right back. Um, an interesting development uh, occurred last week when the supply of USDC on Ethereum surpassed the supply of Tether on Ethereum. This is a strong signal to the market that investors are finding comfort in a more, in a more transparent stablecoin operation. And it also speaks to the type of investor that has been getting more active on Ethereum. Uh, the recent transaction fees on chain on Ethereum north of $30 for, per transaction on average have priced out many, many small users. 
and larger investors and institutions tend to place a lot more emphasis on the type of stablecoin that they are using for their transactions. This has led to a surge in popularity in USDC as it is one of the most transparent stablecoin operators out there. Uh, and it is the stablecoin that we use here at Let It. In other DeFi news, uh, The Economist, which is a publication that does not dedicate much attention to the crypto uh, industry, wrote an entire piece um, on the race to dominate the DeFi eco ecosystem and went on to talk about why Ethereum is losing market share. As we've mentioned in the past, high transaction fees on the Ethereum chain and massive incentive packages for competing layer one blockchains have led to a proliferation of DeFi activity across other chains. Who will win, uh, as this article mentions, still remains to be seen. Uh, and the competing chains, while the competing chains all look very attractive now, if and when they reach the same scale that Ethereum has today, they will very likely face a future of congested transactions and expensive transaction fees and limited uh, bandwidth, the same things that ex Ethereum is experiencing or having to deal with right now. So it will be very interesting to see how this space and this competition for the smart contract layer one um, plays out. Moving over to our Bitcoin mining difficulty commentary, we see that the um, next adjustment is actually scheduled for Wednesday. So tomorrow, sometime tomorrow, and it's expected to bring our difficulty to a fresh all time high of 26.4 terahashes. Um, here we can see the network hash rate uh, courtesy of CoinMetrics. Um, as expected, it did not take long for the hash rate to keep gaining into the new year. Um, we've now essentially made back um, all of the uh, hashing rate that was lost when China uh, issued its mining ban earlier in 2021. Um, switching back to the mempool, the mempool remains very clear. Transaction costs and speeds remain at optimal levels. And another interesting uh, development that happened in the mining space was that Bitmain announced its uh, most recent Bitcoin miner for 2022, which is the Antminer S19 Pro Plus Hyde, Hyde, H -I -D, Hydro. <laughs> um, and this is the first product that provides out of the box liquid cooling technology. It surpasses its predecessor by a 41% uh, hash rate uptick, uh, hashing at 198, so one, 198 terahashes per second. Um, so mining hardware pr production continues to grow, innovation continues to, to you know, uh, flourish in the space, uh, and the efficiency and the duration of Bitcoin ASIC miners um, has actually never been this good. It just continues to get better. So great, great things to see. And as always, we wrap up with what is ahead for the week. As we mentioned earlier, earlier, it's a quiet week ahead for the Fed as they prepare for next week's FOMC meeting, which will surely uh, impact markets. The um, having a quiet week at the Fed means that the market focus for this week will likely be on U.S. corporate earnings with a slew of companies reporting Q4 2021 results this week. Interestingly, two of the most prominent U.S. banks that service crypto companies, these are Silvergate and Signature Bank, both report earnings today. Given that the recent amount of VC capital or given the recent amount of VC capital that has been pouring into the crypto space and crypto companies, it would not be surprising for these two banks to surprise investors with their results. Um, in addition to these, here's a list of relevant earnings for the week ahead. Um, so as we mentioned today, we have uh, Signature Bank and Silvergate Bank both reporting uh, right now, actually before market open. E and we also have Goldman Sachs reporting earnings before market open. Morgan Stanley reports earnings tomorrow, Wednesday, before market open. And on Thursday, we get earnings from Netflix uh, timing is still to be determined there, uh, but it will be coming out on Thursday. So that uh, we've reached the end of today's show. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Um, if you enjoyed the content, if you learned something, if you laughed, uh, we welcome you to hands up, thumbs up, like the show, subscribe and share it with your friends. Um, and if you don't yet have a Ledin account, I welcome you to check out Ledin.io and learn how you can start earning up to 9.5% on your USDC and act up to 6.25% on your first half Bitcoin. We also have the best rates on dollar loans if you need uh, liquidity and don't want to sell your stack. And we also have the world's first Bitcoin mortgage product that helps you buy property with the Bitcoin you already own. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful week and see you next time.